not his wish for the church to be the devil's punching bag. He's created us to be like him. He's created us to be the example and the epitome of love that Skeeter sings about tonight. But as we go back and look at the life of Christ, he tells his disciples clearly, these things that you've seen me do, shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, not because you're greater, but because I go to the Father. So why is it so unfortunate that in present day church, and let me tell you something, the church is not the four walls and a roof. The, the church is the people. This is the temple of God. This is the body of Christ. So why is it we're being the victims instead of the victors? Why is it we're being defeated day in and day out in our, our, as we go through life just letting the devil ambush us and punch us in the mouth and take it and not stand and fight against it, not use the authority that's given unto us? Why is that? Oftentimes it's because we don't recognize who we are in Christ. Better yet, who he is in us. Listen. Can I get up on this for a second? No disrespect. This, 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 this is the only body. This is the only lips that words of Christ that people will see and hear is you. It's you. He said that of his church that you're the light of the world. And a light set on a hill can't be hid. So why are so many of our family members and our friends and our associates and our acquaintances, why are they stumbling around in the dark? And it's simply because we're not letting our lights shine. Now let me clear something up. You can't make it shine, but you can let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Not going to hide it under a bush, not going to blow it out, Snuff it out, I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all remember that word? I'm going to let it shine. And all we have to do is let God be God and his enemies will be scattered. But we've got to let him. We've got to unleash him. We've got to turn him loose. We've got to let him come out of our mouth. We've got to let people see our hands be willing to get in the ditch with them and help them up out of the ditch. We've got to be willing to sacrifice and give of ourselves, our times and our efforts. Word of God clearly says that, and the people that do know their gods shall do exploits. Not might do, shall do. Exploits. What's an exploit? Something great and wonderful and powerful. Now, sometimes we, we misconstrue those things in our mind. Did you know that if you so much as give a drink of cool water in his name, you have a prophet's reward? You see, to get to that place, the word of God simply says that I must decrease so that he can increase. If you want the power of God in your life, then learn to turn you off and let him turn on. I better move on real quick. Somebody, whose roast was that in the oven? I want to go home with you. Genesis chapter 22. I want to share with you a message tonight the Lord has dropped in my heart. I very seldom title sermons. I just read and preach. But if I had to title one, this one would be called Seven Steps to Greatness. God wants his church, his people. That's you, his church. That's you. Get that in your head. The church is you to rise to the level of greatness. Let's read chapter 22, verse 1. Let me get a sip of water first. Got a lot of reading to do. 
And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. Now that word tempt in this context is one of those words that has multiple meanings. It means test in this occasion. And that God did test or tempt Abraham and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Let me stop again right here. I seldom do that. We all know that Abraham had more than one son. Why did it say thine only son? We know that he had a, uh, well, illegitimate or out of wedlock, so to speak, with his handmaiden Hagar once uh, they decided that they were too old and that Sarah couldn't conceive. They took it upon themselves. Mankind took it upon themselves to just help God out a little bit. Hello. Instead of waiting on the promise of God. So this only son that he's talking about is the son of promise, the son of covenant. Might I add at this point that the illegitimate son is the reason that historically throughout the years, even to present day, is why all of the trouble in the Middle East exists. You see, the descendants of Ishmael, they claim to be the sons of Abraham too, and they claim those promises that God made to Abraham that would transport uh, through Isaac to this present generation. That's what the battles have been about all of these hundreds and hundreds of years over there. But God right here in this passage of Scripture is recognizing the son of promise, the son of covenant. So take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him that for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and he saddled his ass and he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and he said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. I could stop and go to preaching right there. We all know that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that God will provide himself a lamb, but I better keep reading. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they were come to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went, and he took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time. And he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand of the sea upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of thine enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice." Seven steps to greatness. <clears throat> the first step is the step of submission. We find that in verse 3. 
But prior to that in verse 2, if you notice, God told Abraham straight up, right from the get-go, what was going on. He said, I I want you to take your son, your only son, unto a place that I'll show you, and there offer him up for a sacrifice. And there kill him. And there shed his blood. God didn't wait and try to catch him by surprise and trap him. He told him from the get-go, take thy son to a place that I'm going to show you and there offer him up for a sacrifice. Now let me say this. Fail this first step and you will live and you will die frustrated. The step of submission is one of the hardest things in America to accomplish because we live in a nation that has made us soft and has made us spoiled and has gotten us to a place of what I want, how I want it, when I want it, like I want it. To heck with everybody else. It's me and my and it's become to a, we've become a nation of so inward vision that we forget what's out there. We forget the great commission of going and telling and making disciples and baptizing. We forget the loving thy neighbor as thyself. We forget denying ourselves and serving God. We forget to, to crucify myself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. It's no longer I that liveth. I'm not at the place I can fully say that yet, are you? I'm trying to get there. I'm struggling to get there. I'm trying to decrease so that he can increase. But we've got to accomplish the step of submission. Submission first to God, to the laws of our land, to those that are in the authority over us. Children, obey your parents. Honor your parents. Spouses, submit. Prefer one another. Serve one another. Quit being so selfish and prideful that it's me, 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 I, I, I. Submit. Submit yourself therefore unto the Lord. See, there's something about submitting. There's something about that humility of submitting that you give God something that He can exalt because he, He exalts the humble but He resists the proud. Pride has become such a prevalent problem in America, particularly in our churches. Kind of sets you up for this, but who can tell me the first sin, the original sin? Don't be scared. It's what most people say. And they believe that because we've been taught to believe that. That's not the first sin. The first sin was committed by Lucifer, who was the praise and worship leader in heaven. And it was pride that came in where he thought of himself as God and got his little fanny booted out of there along with a third of the angels. And pride has been an issue since the fall of Lucifer in heaven to this present day and it is increasing. It's becoming more and more and more of a, of, of a problem in the society in which we live. Pride goeth forth before a fall. Ask Satan. Ask Lucifer. Pride goeth forth before destruction. The Lord resists the proud. Pride will be your nemesis. Pride will be a weight about your spiritual neck and physical neck that will take you down. The step of submission. Take thy son, thine only son. Secondly, there's a step of sensitivity. See in verse 4, where when he got to the place, he saw the place, a sensitivity to the spirit and to the voice of God. In New Testament church, we've been charged to not walk by sight, but to walk by faith. 
full of his spirit. He said, if we walk in the spirit, we'll not fulfill the flesh. The flip side of that is if we don't walk in the spirit, we will fulfill the flesh every time. And in the flesh dwells no good thing. In the flesh we see come to pass in the scripture for it says, from whence comes envy and strife and contentions and murders and backbitings and railings and God. Where does all that come from? Comes from within. Within the body, the individual, the human being, the so-called church of Christ. We see where the word says, out of the mouth comes blessings and cursings, sweet and bitter water. This shouldn't be. And the Lord's constantly telling us to turn the searchlight of heaven on in our own hearts, in our own spirits, and examine ourselves and ask Him to help us correct those things that need to be corrected. I assure you, we all know, and we've said it countless times, that the definition of Christian is what? Christ-like. Being like Jesus. When we get saved, we begin a journey with the Holy Spirit in us who is the teacher that will lead God and direct us into all truths, will teach us all things. Now in Louisiana, all means all. That's all all means. He'll teach us all things. Now good teaching is scriptural. Good teaching is ordered of God as part of the fivefold minister ministry. Pastors, prophets, preachers, teachers, and evangelists. We need good teaching. But if everything that you believe spiritually is based upon something that someone taught you, how do you know it's right? See, we've got to become seekers of God for ourselves. We've got to get to a place that we have a sensitivity to his voice. We can hear his voice because he said, my sheep know my voice and another they'll not follow. Meaning there are a lot of voices out there. I'm fortunate that I, I coached for 25 years at, at a program down in Louisiana that has had a lot of success. Chris is very familiar with it. And while I was there, we had 17 district championships and 12 state championships and three state runner-ups and one national title. And so we, we were accustomed to having recruiters from all over the country coming in recruiting those athletes. And some of the things that I would tell those young men is be careful to the voices that you listen to. Because there's going to be a lot of voices out there and most of them do not have your best interest at heart. They've got their best interest at heart. They want to hang with you because you're cool and you're an athlete and you can get them tickets to the game and they want to try to do everything to get you to turn to this and to turn to that and the next thing you know, you're in trouble. I'll share this one story. My son, Tony, who Chris knows real well, God doesn't say a whole lot. He, he's a big old boy, got guns about like that and played center, uh, three-time All-State. I kept telling him what I'm talking to you about right now. Be careful of the voices. Watch who you hang out with. Watch what you allow going on. Well, they'd been at school about three weeks. They went for two a days up in Arkansas. I know, boo. I tried to get him to go somewhere else. <laughs> I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning. How many of you know there's never a good phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning? I said, hello? Dad. I said, yeah, bud, what's wrong? You're not going to believe what just happened. I thought, oh, Lord. What? (laughs) He said, Dad, I woke up. Hope this don't offend nobody. If it does, you've got to forgive me. You can't go to heaven with unforgiveness in your heart. <laughs> he said, Dad, I woke up and there's a naked girl in my bed. I said, in the athletic dorm? Yes, sir. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I shoved her out on the floor and told her to get out before the coach caught us. I thought, dang, I hope he's not a queer. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. No, I was very proud of him for that. But you see, it's a classic example of where you can be minding your own business. You can be doing the right things. 
being in the right place. And what had happened is his roommate, a boy from Pittsburgh, Texas, played linebacker for him. He was quite an quite a party animal and he'd been he dated one he was an upperclassman and he dated one of the cheerleaders and they'd been trying to get tony to date her friend and tony wasn't interested had a girlfriend back home etc etc and so they had all been out partying when they come in tony's in the bed asleep and she just crawled in bed. that's how that happened but my point in behind all of this is you need to be careful of the voices that you listen to And you need to get to where no matter how right something seems, no matter how right something appears, that your ability to hear the voice of God, the Spirit of God, supersedes and trumps whatever seems to be right. Because you see, Scripture says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. But I want you to know when you allow God to direct your steps, to guide your path, When you let the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet, show us where to walk, how to talk, what to say, when to stand still, when to move, when to back up, when to give, when to just fold your arms and stand there. Because there's a time for all things. For everything, there's a time and there's a season. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. And the list goes on and on. And how do you know when that time is? By learning his voice. By learning to be sensitive to him saying, that's the place. That's the place. Now is the time. Thirdly, and I'll hurry along so your roast don't burn. Verse 5 is a step of separation. Because there in verse 5, you see, he he, he told those young men, y'all stay here with the ass while the lad and I go yonder and worship. Sometimes in order to get where God's wanting to take you, to get to the place of obedience to God. Sometimes you have to leave things and people and stuff behind in order to go up to where God is trying to take you. It's important that you purpose in your heart that you will be the man or woman of God that he desires for you to be. And don't you let anyone, anything, nothing else stop you short of becoming all he wants you to be. And you control that. Fourthly, in verse 6, we've got to set the stage. You see where he builds an altar. He does everything that's within his power and his ability to do. Lays the wood upon it. He's made ready the altar. See, Scripture tells us that faith without works is dead. Once you've heard Him, once you've gone to the place, once you know you're, you're where you're supposed to be, now He expects you to put your hands to the plow and for you to do everything that you can physically do, spiritually do, financially do, emotionally do, relationally do. He wants you to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. But we have limits as human beings. Has anybody discovered that beside me? I'm limited as to what I can do. But I've also discovered this, that when I've done what I can do, I've given him something to work with because he said, whatever my hands find to do, do it with all my might unto the Lord and he'll cause whatever I've put my hands to to prosper same goes for you when I say I I'm talking about I the church we the church we the people we his body and here's the cool thing when we do that he puts his super on our natural and things explode and happen and we accomplish stuff that we could never in and of ourselves. Do. So we've got to set the stage, do our part. Fifthly, in verse 9, we've got to sacrifice. He lays his son up on the altar, takes his knife, about to kill him. Let me inject this at this point. If it's not something that you love, it's not a sacrifice. If it's not something that requires 
a denying yourself in order to fulfill it, it's not a sacrifice. See, I've got to go back to Louisiana. Probably take $150, $60 in diesel fuel one way. And if I only have $200 in my pocket, and I see a need, and God says, give that person 100 that's a sacrifice. Now, if I happen to have $1,000 in my pocket, that's not a sacrifice. Case in point. A sacrifice is something that requires you giving up something, and it's usually something that you love. Went through a period of time where I had to sacrifice by laying my lariat rope down. Because, you see, I got to a place I was having a little success, and I let roping take precedence over God. I began to be consumed with winning. Now, I believe we should always desire to do our best and practice and try to do the best that we can. But look, roping, as you've heard other people say, roping is not who I am. It's just what I do. I'm a child of God, and He will share His glory with no one nor nothing but also recognize this what you're gifted to do and what you're passionate about doing normally you're passionate about it because you're pretty good at it that's why you're passionate at it and how do you think you had the gift and the ability to get good at it because it's a God-given thing And he just wants to be involved in your doing whatever it is if it's hitting a golf ball and Chris ain't no good at golf I've seen him neither am I But it's sacrifice. Sacrifice. What is it that God may call upon you to give? Seventh, and I'll hurry through this, is we've got to substitute. Because you see, once God saw that Abraham was willing to give up someone that he dearly loved, that's all he wanted to know was, was he willing? And he says, hold up. Don't touch the lad. Don't harm him. Don't hurt him. There's a ram caught by the horns. That became the sacrifice. So we have to have the ability to switch with what God provides. So oftentimes, what we think we know, what we think we've seen, you'll find that there will be a switching. Their God will switch. And you've got to have that ability that I talked about earlier to recognize, this is a God-provided thing. And to be able to go in that direction. Now everything that we just read and talked about. I want to conclude with the last line of verse 18. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. See Deuteronomy chapter 28. Paraphrased. It says if you hear these sayings of mine and doeth them. Keep them. These blessings shall pursue you and overtake you. See, you can't even outrun the blessings of God. When you're doing what he tells you to do, what his word says, what he speaks into your heart by his Holy Spirit, when you're walking in obedience to what he says, these blessings shall pursue you and overtake you. Then he goes on to list them. He's going to bless your storehouse. He's going to bless your kids. He's going to bless your cattle. He's going to bless your crops. He's going to bless your fruit. He's going to bless it all because you're walking in obedience to him. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? You know, I always like to quote the verse of every man examining himself. I haven't driven up here to preach at you or to judge you or to condemn you or to make you live up to any standards that I have. It's the furthest thing in the world from the truth. I've simply come here this week to tell you how much God loves you and how much He wants to be involved in your life and how much He wants to give you things that money can't buy starting with eternal life. But peace and joy and strength and how He wants to provide all of your needs according to His riches and glory. He, he intimately 
wants to bless you. He just wants you to include Him into your life. If you're here tonight and you're not in a right relationship with the Lord and you'd like to ask Him to forgive you and to cleanse you, if you're willing to submit tonight to swallow your pride and to bow the knee of your heart and say, Lord, I need You. I need Your forgiveness. I need Your cleansing. I need You to come into my life. And to help me so that I can be pleasing to you. As you look at your life and you recognize that need. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? Anyone, anywhere, real quickly. Yes, sir, thank you. Anyone else, very quickly. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else, very quickly. Thank you, sir. Quickly, this is your moment. This is your time. Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. He's knocking on the door. But you must open it. He's not going to kick it down. I ask one or two more times, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? Slip it up. Thank you, sir. Slip it right back down. Anyone else? Very quickly. All right, every head's bowed, every eye's closed. This is what the Word of God says, to be saved, to be cleansed, to be made whole, to have life. We must just simply recognize the fact That Jesus is the Son of God. That He came to this earth and He lived a sinless life. He shed His blood and He died on Calvary's tree. So that we could live. But the good thing is He didn't just stay dead. Three days later He walked out of a grave. Demonstrated His ability and His power over life and death. So that He can give you life. And that today he's alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Making intercession for each and every one of us. Scripture says if we believe that in our heart. And confess with our mouth. The Lord Jesus. We're saved. And so in case you don't know how to pray. I'm, I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now. I know this may be different than what you're used to doing. But this is what the Lord's leading me to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And. The really cool thing is God knows the thought and intent of our heart. He knows if you're sincere and honest. That's good. So with everyone, whether you raised your hand or not, with everyone under the sound of my voice, would you pray with me these words? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sin. I do believe that you're the Son of God that died so I could live. And so now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. To cleanse me with your blood. To come into my life. Be my Savior. And to be my Lord. To teach me. To help me. To learn your ways. So that I can be pleasing to you. I ask you, Lord. To fill me with your spirit. And do me with your power. Let me learn your voice. So that another I'll not follow. In Jesus name. Amen. Every head still bowed. Every head still bowed. I want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. You're here tonight. And you have an addiction of some sort. Now, no one's looking around. You see, the Word of God tells us that for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. He's come to set at liberty those that are bound. Many of us struggle with many things. God wants to help you. Delivered me from a fifth of whiskey and four packs of cigarettes and a six pack of beer every day. He can do the same thing for you. Maybe you're here and you're struggling with whatever it may be. Pornography or gambling or drinking or whatever. You've got an addiction. I want to give you a quick sermon. Please stay with me. Every head bowed. There's a passage of scripture in the gospels that says, There came unto Jesus a man with a withered hand. And Jesus said unto him, Stretch forth thine hand. 
And he stretched forth his hand, and it became whole, as was his other hand. Now in the story, we know the man had a good hand, and we had a withered hand. The good hand represented his abilities, his talents, his usefulness, things that he could do something with. But this withered hand represented something ugly in his life. Something that was useless. Something that hindered him. Something that held him back and limited him. Now watch this. When Jesus said, stretch forth thine hand, he did not say which one. See, churches across America are full of people with a witheredness of some sort. And if you choose to keep that withered hand in your pocket and stretch your whole hand out to the Lord, you can leave with a withered hand. But if you're willing to swallow your pride and stick that witheredness out there and say, God, here's something that's ugly in my life. Something that I don't like. Something that I don't need. And I can't get the victory over it. Here it is, Lord. If you'll help me, here it is. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real quick. Slip it up, slip it right back down. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Quickly. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? I'm going to move on. I'm going to ask one more time. Because I feel like the Lord is still dealing with someone. This is your moment. We're going to pray and believe for deliverance tonight. Anyone else? Very quickly. Very quickly. All right. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to pray. You ask the Lord specifically for what it is that you need in your life. Lord Jesus, you said in your word that we can come before your throne of grace and obtain mercy and help in our time of need. Many hands have gone up across this place tonight, Lord, saying they need help in their life. There's a witheredness. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, we ask you tonight, to come and to deliver and to set free these that are bound up with habits and addictions. Lord, we take authority and dominion over that in Jesus' name because you've come to give liberty from that. And we ask that the curse, we ask that that addiction, we ask that that weight, we ask that that problem be gone by the authority and the power of the name of Jesus. And we'll be sure to say thank you and to give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Still keep your heads bowed just for one moment, please. The Lord, show me something else. You're here tonight, and your marriage is struggling. Slip your hand up real quick. Anyone, anywhere. No one's looking around. I just want to pray for your home. I want to pray for your home. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Know this, each and every one of you that raised your hand, please. God wants to heal. God wants to restore that marriage and make it better than it's ever been. You lean upon Him. You trust Him. Even though you may not see a way of how it's going to happen, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him and He's going to direct your path and restore and heal these marriages. So Lord, you've seen these hands. You know the devil would love to destroy these homes. God, you're the one that instituted marriage you're the one that anointed it and put your blessings upon it and so Lord we consecrate these marriages to you afresh and we ask that you would come on the scene and cause all parties involved to swallow their prides and to get honest and clear with one another and to ask for forgiveness and to say they're sorry and to do what's necessary Lord to to heal this relationship Glorify yourself through these people. We'll be sure to say thank you and to give you the praise for that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. And let me say this. Uh, Brother Dean, myself, Skeeter, different other ones will be around to talk with you, to pray with you about anything that, that you need to, to talk or pray about. That's what we're here for. We, we haven't come to put on a show. We've come to be... 
available to you to try to help you. Now, if you've surrendered your life to Christ last night or tonight, would you please come see Pastor or, or myself? preferably pastor because he's going to be here and I'm going to be gone but I'm available also so brother Dean are we on yes thank you Dennis hey glory to God to touch your heart tonight that's the word of God. Holy Spirit, I felt the Holy Spirit moving during praise and worship and all night. Listen, do not let pride get in your way of receiving everything God's got for you. We're not here to judge, man. We all come from the same stuff. We were all lost. We love you. God loves you. So before you leave here, if you need anything, you need prayer for healing, you need prayer for finances, marriage, whatever it may be. We're not judging. We're here for you. We just love you so much. Bring a friend next week. Let's share what God's doing in our lives with somebody else. This is the greatest gift and it's free. So don't hang on to it. Get it out there. Amen. God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dismiss. Lord, Father, we just praise you and thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to come tonight. Lord, I just ask you to touch each and every one of these people here today. Just bless their lives with your spirit, Father. Guide and direct them. Let them hear your voice so that we can get the blessings that you have for us and we can be put into action for your kingdom. Lord, we just thank you for those that raised their hands tonight, that they need you and they trust in you, Father, that they raise their hands, they stretch forth their withered hand, Father, to receive the healing or the help that they need, Father, and we praise you for that. And, Lord, let not our human pride get in our way, but let the spiritual person inside of each and every one of us come through. And God be with us. Let us travel safely, Father. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, uh, remember the CDs over here? I missed them. He's got them. They're $10.